Uh, one of the things we do every time we come together is to pray to God together. We speak to God together knowing that God listens. We listen to God together knowing that God speaks. We do this through prayers with the people. I'm going to lead us with a prayer of confession, and then we'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll say, hear our prayers. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Then do a Trinitarian prayer. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we'll pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we'll lift up some individual names, and I'll say, are there any others? And it's your chance to say up the names of people who we want to pray for, people who have uh, things to celebrate, people who are going through times of struggle. Uh, those names will fill the air around us, because that's how always and everywhere God hears the prayers of God's people. So now, as a church, please join me in prayer. Oh God, your call for justice is so clear that we are amazed at how easily we fail to hear you over the noise of daily life. We want to stop doing evil. We want to learn to do good. Yet we rarely do all we can to rescue, defend, and plead for those in need. As you have sought us out, so we seek your pardon. Grant us courage, we pray, as persons, as communities, and as nations, to bring about the justice you desire. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, you are the creator of all things, everything, and all that you create, you name good. And we see evidence of that goodness all around us, new life, new love, new families, new forgiveness, new hope, new opportunity. For each and every one of these things, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, what you create, you make to be free. And over and over again, that freedom is exercised for the purposes of sin, death, violence, destruction, greed, hatred. Remind us, O oh God, that when we were at our worst, when we are at our worst, you did not forsake us or turn away from us, but joined us, came alongside us in the power and presence of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And through his life and death and resurrection, you offer redemption, reconciliation, and salvation for each and every one of us, now and always. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Always and everywhere, O oh God, life is hard. The way is difficult. We feel alone. Remind us that you are always with us through your Holy Spirit, your advocate, your breath, your love with us, guiding us, keeping us, shaping us, changing us, teaching us. Teach us to rely on you, God, who are always with us. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Nancy, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Indy, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our For Chris, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Are there any others? Hear our Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord, in your mercy. For all these names spoken out loud and all the names kept in the silence of our hearts, O oh God, hear our prayers. For all of those who struggle to face another day, to pick up the pieces, to find the strength to go on, hear our prayers. For all of those who are experiencing your joy, your love, your grace, and your peace in ways never before known, hear our prayers. And for each and every person reaching out for you for a fresh start, for a new way, for a new life, hear our prayers. Guide us. Keep us, lead us in your ways, and Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Amen. Again, everyone, welcome. My name is Lance. This is The Gathering. I'm so glad that you're with us. So one of the things that we do here at The Gathering is focus on topics of conversation for a number of weeks in a row. This is a very special season in the life of the church called Lent. Lent is 40 days plus Sundays lead up to Easter, and it's always an extra time in the life of most churches for focusing uh, on some of the harder aspects of life, some of the things that really struggle, make us struggle, that challenge us, that threaten us, that cause us uh, to worry, that upset our faith. Uh, it's a chance for us to look at all the ways in which we deeply need Christ so that when we get to experience uh, the joy of the resurrection, we're able to receive it for the good news that it truly is. And so one of the things that we've been talking about over and over again uh, and through the gathering is a topic that is uh, really alive in each one of our hearts, right? It's something that impacts the way that we think about ourselves. It impacts the way that we think about our careers. It impacts the way that we think about our families. It impacts the way that we think about our lives and our relationship with God. And that is the idea of fear, 
right? We've been talking about fear over and over again uh, for the last couple weeks, and uh, specifically certain types of fears, right? Um, we've been talking, oh, my kingdom for a dry erase marker. <laughs> well, would someone grab it for me? I'm going to stand up here and look like I know what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, welcome to the gathering, guys. This is kind of how we roll. Oh, it's because it was on the other side of the board. <clears throat> welcome to the gathering, carefully orchestrated and always prepared. Uh, we've been talking about fears, and not just general fears, not just fear uh, overall, but specific types of fear that we actually encounter in our lives, right? I mean, our life is lived on the ground in the real world. Uh, there's real fears that each and every one of us face, and I wanted to talk about those, and specifically what it is that uh, the Christian story, the Holy Scriptures, uh, the narrative of who we are and Jesus has to say about these. So week one, we just talked really briefly uh, about the fear of failure, right? And failure in particular is a fear that is extremely resonant in people the younger they are. Right, some we it gets reported less and less as people age, as they kind of grow into themselves. But people in their 40s, their 30s, their 20s, and their teens, over and over again, uh, represent this deep and abiding fear of failure. Right, and we talked about well, when you're talking about a fear of failure, you're really talking about the thing behind the thing. Right, you're afraid of the rejection that you might encounter. You're afraid of the feeling of alienation that will happen. You're afraid of the feeling of shame. What if you really try something and it doesn't work out? Right, whether that's getting into a college or making a grade or starting a career or taking a risk in a relationship. Right, what happens if we actually experience failure? Right, and we we seem to tell this story over and over again about ourselves and what it could be like, and so. To study on that, we didn't just look at, uh, you know, quotes from the Bible that say, do not fear. We actually looked at what happens when you fail, right? What happens when you fail? And we looked at the story of the biggest failure that's ever happened. Peter, the apostle, the, the disciple that Jesus gave the responsibility of starting the church to, Jesus, or Peter fails Jesus spectacularly on the very moment when Jesus needed him the most, right? When Jesus is at his worst, at his lowest, his most afraid, his most isolated, Peter looks at him and says, I have no idea who you are right? So we looked at what happens. How does God view you when you are a failure? All right, how does God view failure? Uh, and we, we looked at the story. What Peter ultimately finds in God and Christ is reconciliation and redemption and the proclamation that you are not bad or broken, right? You find love and hope and peace there, right? So let that be a greater story that you encounter rather than the story of the fear of failure. The next week, last week, we talked about the fear of their not being enough. The fear of there not being enough. Not being enough what? Not being enough money. Not being enough viable spouses. Not being enough educational opportunities, right? Not being enough jobs. You name it, but there's this overriding fear that there was not going to be enough. In fact, uh, studies by Chapman University show that this is one of the number one reported fears over and over and over again, decade after decade. Uh, you know, Despite trends internationally in politics, despite trends uh, domestically over and over again, this presiding fear is a fear of there not being enough, not being enough. And so one of the things that we answered uh, or we brought up, if you're going to live your life in trying to avoid having this fear, you need to realize what is the thing that you're most relying on? What is the thing that you're most looking forward to? What is the thing that you are worshiping, which means placing at the center of your life, right? We looked at these stories, um, and uh, over and over again, if you live with an idol at the center of your life, whether that's a literal idol, like we studied uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, right, some other god, or whether it's a, a modern-day idol like money or career or fame or success. If you live with an idol at the center of your life, the story you is all, you're always going to hear is you are not enough. You have not sacrificed enough. You have not made enough. You have not earned, achieve, earned enough, achieved enough. Uh, you have not qualified enough. You have not made enough happen. If you live with an idol at the center of your life, the story you will always live with until the day you die is you are not enough because idols demand that you always give more. However, if you live with Christ at the center of your life and the overriding story is the Christ who proclaims that I am enough and you are enough for me. If you live with Christ at the center of your life, then the very foundation of who you are when things are good and who you are when things are terrible and falling apart is that Christ is at the center of your life and Christ is always proclaiming that he is enough and that you are enough for him, right? So if you live with this constant fear of there's not gonna be enough, not gonna be enough money, 
when I retire. There's not going to be enough jobs for me when I re-enter the workplace. There's not going to be enough viable spouses for me. There's not going to be enough career opportunities for me, even though we live in a society that has generated uh, more wealth, more opportunities for employment, more opportunities for education, and more opportunities for romantic connection than ever before. If you still live with the fear that there's not going to be enough, then what you need to realize is you're living with an idol at the center of your life, and you desperately need to replace that with the love and presence of Christ. So that's what we talked about in the last few weeks. And the interesting thing about these, though, is that these are fears that people might self-report, right? These are fears, these are fears that people might actually proclaim uh, about themselves. They might actually say, yeah, I am, I am afraid of not being enough, right? When people answer surveys over and over again. That's one of the things they say. And when we ask young people, what are you most afraid of? They'll say, it's, it's a fear of failure. I'm really afraid of failing. I'm really afraid of putting myself out there. And I'm really afraid of not succeeding, Uh, there is a fear that is huge and predominant uh, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our families, for sure in this room, right? However, it is a fear that we are very hesitant to self-proclaim about ourselves because it doesn't fit the story of who we are, and that is the fear of change, right? Very few people are willing to stand up and say like, oh my gosh, I'm terrified of change. My life is a straw house, and if you take one piece away, I'm destroyed, right? Very few people are capable of saying, like, you know what? I go to work, and I do my job, and if you mess up one thing, I'm going to be passive-aggressive for, like, a year, (laughs) right? No one's capable of saying that, and yet over and over and over again, we have evidence and witness of the deep problems that happen when people are forced to encounter change, right? I mean, some of these can be really little changes. Um, For example, Uh, There was a period of time between like 2007 and 2010 uh, where Facebook was still kind of small, right? But, you know, it's it's still kind of small, but every six months they're changing something. They're changing the news feed. They're changing the way that profiles work. And you would have thought that World War III had been declared in my life of fellow people in the early 20s every time there was a Facebook change, right? This little change in our lives just totally threw everybody off. Uh, If anyone here is a Snapchatter, I'm looking out, probably not a prime Snapchat community. Um, Shalia's waving her hand in the back, (laughs) right? Uh, Yeah, like Snapchat rolled out a new app just a couple weeks ago. Shalia, do you like the new Snapchat app? Thumbs down, she's saying. See, Shalia does not like change. I'm just going to preach at her for the next half hour. The rest of y'all can hang in there, right? We can't handle even these little bitty changes, right? Uh, Sometimes there's more significant changes, right? Anybody ever been in a workplace? that has undergone some significant changes, right? Significant changes in who reports to who, right? Significant changes in what our goals or vision is. Significant changes in how we view ourselves, how we spend our time, right? Every single one of you, I'm sure, has experienced this in your life, right? Unless, what, what, I can't imagine a field that has been literally unchanged for 50 years, unless you, like, knit professionally, then, well, no, Etsy, no, no field, <laughs> Right? Everyone has faced significant changes, right? And they, they, they every, and, and you know, you know that we don't handle that well, right? You know, no one's ever met in the, you know, gone out to, uh, gone out to Joe T's on a Friday with their coworkers after some significant changes in their workplace, and everyone just sits around the margaritas and goes, "Gosh, I'm really happy. <laughs> I'm feeling this overriding trust in our leaders." <laughs> I feel like they're very insightful and they get me, right? You too? Man, more gratitude here. Uh, that is seldom the case, right? We face these, these are pretty good medium-sized changes. And then we face huge, huge, huge life changes, right? Marriages, birth of children, moving across the country, changing careers. Those are some positive ones. What about the end of relationships? What about the loss of children? What about devastating permanent illness? What about poverty, right? We experience massive changes in our lives, each and every one of us. And one of the things that I need you to understand about change, particularly when it comes to the relationship between fear and change, is that change, even good changes, right? Every change is going to include loss, right? It's going to include loss of power, right? Realizing that you don't have the power that you thought you did, right? Even if it's positive, negative, no matter what, it's going to include a loss of power. It's going to include a loss of control, right? It might include loss of connections. 
It might include loss of relationships. It might include loss of order or loss of peace. Change always and everywhere, whether that's in your social media programs or your most intimate relationships. Change is always going to result in losses, and we need to understand that. But there's another loss, too, that I think lies at the heart of our fear of change, and that is the loss of our plan. We have lost our plan. I had a vision for how this was going to go. I had an expectation for what my family life was going to look like. I had a plan for my career, and whether that was 50 years from now or for the next five days before you rearranged my dang cubicle, I had a plan for how this was going to go. I had a plan for my education, and it did not include not getting in to my preferred college. I had a plan for my relationship, and it did not involve it coming to an end after 10 years. I had a plan for my health, and it involved being able to walk without pain past my 50s. I had a plan, and I have lost it, and I am deeply, deeply upset. I had a, uh, the first ever pastoral council uh, session I ever received. Uh, whatever I was on the receiving end of it was when I was 24 years old, and I was in the hospital, and I was deeply in pain. I had been in there for a long period of time, and I was going to be in there for an even longer period of time. I had no understanding of what was happening to my body. I had no understanding of how sick I was or might be. I was deeply afraid, and I asked for the pastor, Stephen Bell, one of my favorite people, uh, the pastor at my home church, to come and visit with me. And when he sat down at 11 o'clock at night, I didn't know we could make pastoral care visits that late, but that's how Stephen rolls. He shows up at 11 o'clock at night, and the hospital hospital room, and what I want to talk about at 24 years old and sick and in pain is how I have lost my plan. This was not how I planned for my life to go. So I want to set that aside for a little bit. One of the things that we've talked about over and over again is that the inverse of fear is faith, right? Fear and faith are opposites, right? Fear and faith are opposites. Over and over and over again, the Bible's number one commandment by virtue of repetition is do not fear. The positive of that is have faith, right? Fear and faith are inverses. And so one of the pieces of text that talks about faith the most is uh, in the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament. If you want to turn to that, that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. It's also going to be up on the screen. Uh, I always invite you to bring your own Bible. Uh, Hebrews is very close to the back. You might have heard it referred to as Paul's letter to the Hebrews, uh, which is not the best thing to call it because it's not written by Paul, it's not a letter, and it wasn't written to Hebrews. So those are, <laughs> I recommend against that. <laughs> it, wasn't written, it was written to people who were following Christ. They do have a Hebrew background, which is where it gets its name. Um, but uh, over and over again, uh, what this letter is talking about is the relationship between this, this is early Christianity, right? This is the first generation of people who are following Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to get you to understand how this is the culmination and the completion of the long relationship between God and God's people as seen through the covenant people of Israel, right? Their story is our story, he's saying. Their story is our story. You need to understand that. And one of the things that he needs you to understand is that you are to look up to and model the faith of those around you and those who have come before you, right? In this deeply uh, disconcerting time, in this deeply unknowable time, in this deeply scary time and confusing time, what you need to have is faith, he says. And that's what we're going to pick up we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're going to kind of cut off in the middle. It actually is going to keep going longer and longer and longer. Uh, so we're going to stop at about verse 12. That's only going to be half of it, but it's going to be more than enough for you to get the speed of what he's talking about. At the conclusion, I'm going to say God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture, and you're going to say thanks be to God. Hear these words. Faith, the writer of Hebrews says, faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we can't see. The elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. By faith, we understand that the universe has been created by a word from God so that the visible came into existence from the invisible. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice to God than Cain, which showed that he was righteous since God gave approval to him for his gift. Though he died, he's still speaking through faith. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he didn't see death, and he wasn't found because God took him up. He was given approval for having pleased God before he was taken up. It's impossible to please God without faith, because the one who draws near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards people who try to find him. 
by faith, Noah responded with godly fear when he was warned about events he hadn't seen yet. He built an ark to deliver his household. With his faith, he criticized the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes from faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived in the land he had been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob, who were co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah, his wife, received the ability to have a child, though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. So, descendants were born from one man, and he was as good as dead. He was in his 90s. So the writer's saying, like, he was born from one man, and he was as good as dead, (laughs) y'all. They were as many as the number of the stars in the sky, and as countless as the grains of sand on the seashore. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. The earliest community that is reading these words has so many reasons to be afraid, right? <clears throat> Such uncertainty surrounds them, right? They are, so, they are out on new limb. They're out and doing things that no one has ever done. And one of the things that the writer of the Hebrews needs them to understand is that you are not the first person to go through this process. Do you understand? You are not the first person he's writing to them that says you need to, tr- you need to rely on something greater than how you thought this was going to go, how you expected life to be, and just following your plan. You need to realize that you are not the first person to ever encounter this. Look at the stories that came before you. In the earliest days, the thing that set Abel apart was this overall focus on finding God in the midst of where he was. In the earliest days, when the people were filled with sin and distrust, Enoch tried to find find God as best he could and where he was. In the earliest days, Noah. In the earliest days, Abraham. In the earliest days, he goes on to say, Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Rebecca and on and on and on. Each and every place that the people of God have experienced, they had to reach out in faith and in trust, even when the situation that surrounded them was so, so scary. And they were celebrated and they were loved. Let their strength he says, be a model for you, and may you also run the race that has been laid out in front of you. So one of the things that we will mourn with changes, small, medium, and huge, is the loss of the plan. The thing that we could see right? We could see how it was going to work. I could see what my life was going to look like. I could see what the next month was going to be. I could see what my retirement was going to hold for me. I could see it. And then what did we sing in those lyrics? The picture of that future was torn away, right? But here's the thing. That picture was never real, was it? That picture was never actual, was it? It was just a story that we told ourselves, right? What is real is that always and everywhere life will involve change. And being a follower of God in Christ does not mean that all of those changes will be painless. And it does not mean that all of those changes will be easy. And it does not mean that all of the the changes will make life smooth and simple for you. Each and every one of us will experience a change. And what I think you need more than anything else when it comes to experiencing the loss of the plan, right, the loss of the vision, the loss of what you hoped you could see is something a little clearer to look at. I think you need this. A model. You need someone that you can see. Hebrews, the writer We don't know who it is. But he doesn't just say, just think about other people who have experienced the same kind of losses and changes. They're fine. He specifically names people 
right? Look at what happened to Abraham. Look at what happened to Isaac. Look at what happened to Joseph. Look at what happened to Rebekah. Look at what happened to Abel. Look and see the faithfulness of God in the lives of others and know that you can count on the exact same thing happening for you. There's an organization that I love out of Chicago. It's called Immerman Angels. Immerman Angels. Immerman Angels is an organization that you contact when you, have found out, when you find out that you've been diagnosed with cancer. You contact Immerman Angels and you get in touch with them and you say, I'm a man or I'm a woman, I'm this age, this is the situation with my family, this is the kind of cancer I have, this is the kind of treatment that I'm going to have, and they put you in touch with a survivor who at the same age and with the same family situation faced the same kind of diagnosis and received the same kind of treatment, and you get to talk to them and look at them and experience them and learn from them that even though my plan has completely fallen apart, I can see in you this new possible future. Does that make sense? Over and over and over again, you are going to experience difficult changes in your life, changes at work, changes with your family, changes with your health, changes with your career, God forbid, changes with your favorite social media programs. <laughs> what I want you to do the next time this happens is to look at a survivor. Look at someone who has experienced that same change. Fill your life with the people of your scriptures. Fill your life with the people of your community. Fill your life with the people of your church and witness through them over and over and over again their faith and the faithfulness of God in return. Your plan is going to stumble. The plan for your health is going to stumble. The plan for your hopes for the future for your family is going to stumble. It is going to take different directions. It is going to diff take different turns. How many people here are doing exactly what they thought they were going to be doing when they were 15 years old? Right? Fill your life with examples of faithfulness. I have no idea what faithfully pursuing the will of God is going to look like when you have to face what ends up happening and changing in your life. I don't know what faithful pursuit is going to look like in that situation, right? But I desperately want you to have someone in your life who you can look to and see that is what faith looks like. That is what trust looks like. That is what hope in God's promised future looks like. And that is an example to me that no matter what change I have faced, no matter what loss I have experienced, no matter what devastation or joy has occurred to me, the promises and the love and the strength of God are as real for me now as they ever were. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Brothers and sisters, we are here gathered in the house of God, each and every one of us desperately clinging to a plan, desperately clinging to the vision that we have set for how things will go, the way things will turn out, what we hope for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our careers, for our jobs, for our health, for our families. Remind us, O oh God, that these plans, these stories that we tell ourselves are lovely and good. But even greater is the story that you tell us. The story that says, no matter, what, no matter what happens, you are with us. The story that says, no matter what breaks, you will redeem it. The story that says, no matter what wrong turns or false starts we experience, your love is always and present and eternal and in all things, O oh God. We can face tomorrow knowing that through the life and the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you offer us the gift of hope eternal, now and forever. And that will never, ever change. And so it is with great love and thanksgiving that we give you praise, and that we pray the words that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.